Hey guys, I hope this is clear. Uh, my name is Priyatam. Thanks for coming in today. I uh, gather that we are connecting from various parts of the world. So this is fun and new to me as well. So today I'll be covering uh, protocol oriented programming. It is, um, it is a phrase I caught it um, by watching the Apple Dev Conference um, and the Swift guys said that Swift is a protocol oriented programming. And something struck saying that, hey, we, we've got protocols. Um, what's What does that mean in Clojure, Clojure script land? So this is my journey and I'd love to share. Uh, I work in a tiny studio, uh, mostly freelancing in Clojure, Clojure script. Uh, for the past six months, I've been working at Level Money as a platform engineer and an architect. And uh, yeah, let's uh, let's get rolling. So one of the first things I've had uh, had in mind when I started out in my closure closure script journey um, about two and a half years ago was I was I really liked object oriented programming. Uh, I don't say that with with a sense of pride or uh, rejection, but it served it it gave me a whole career. Um, it, it was it was beautiful, etc. And then closure script came in, FP came in, and just like hit me like. Slap, uh, slam on my face. And then I was asking myself, like, what is that I'm leaving behind? And what is that that I'm learning new? I've definitely learned a lot. I haven't written Java in three years, uh, neither jQuery. But there is something something that that is to be said about OO and that we depend on it uh, in, in many ways. And that's kind of what I want to approach um, when, when I think of protocol-oriented programming as, as a as a way to bridge, and and as a way to see, uh, uh, can we kind of work together? Um, that's Dave Abrahams. Uh, if you're if you haven't heard um, of Swift's uh, new development or or where it's heading, I totally recommend his talk called "Protocol-Oriented Programming in Swift." Uh, that is my inspiration for this talk. And uh, he, he said it right there, that it is a fascination, fascinating design space. Uh, so I did a bit of research, kind of, kind of dig back into seeing where um, the creator himself uh, had, had his uh, mindset. And back in 2012, December 16, Rich Hickey did say that right in the second slide, that the core abstractions in ClojureScript are in fact in protocols. Uh, and there were, a, there were many reasons um, that protocols were introduced after proxies, um, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and in this talk, I want to focus on, uh, on a few things. Um, let's, let's just say three things. Um, that, that is the polymorphism, the, the high performance polymorphism that we get uh, both in Clojure, uh, mostly in Clojure as well as Clojure script, uh, the expression problem. And my favorite um, is the new abstractions. And what can we build um, based on our domain knowledge, based on the problem in hand? Uh, but first, uh, we all go through this. Uh, and if you're you're already familiar with this, uh, I ask you to uh, be with me for the next few minutes. Uh, it, it's something we all know, and I think let's let's kind of go through that. Um, what is monkey patching? Uh, I've been a Python and jQuery guy for a long time, and I've been doing this myself um, and that we have to like extend the functionality of an object that we don't have handle on uh, but but a, but a disciplined closure engineer would say hey you can't just do that and expect new types in the future uh, you know you can you can't expect your function to be prepared or your data type to be prepared in the future so what does that mean um, a definition first. I love this uh, quote by Jeff Atwood uh, when he says that um, when he closes his eyes and imagines uh, he can see a per perfect pitch black storm. And that, that's sort of what I think too, and I agree that modifying someone's behavior, uh, some methods just because you can't, you, you can't alter that source code uh, seems enticing in the beginning, but but it's not always good. Um, there are some good patterns, uh, both in Ruby and JS, uh, to kind of avoid that a little bit, uh, but it still is not safe. And um, 
And here's a little sample, um, just to refresh our memory. Like we can do monkey patching today, although py uh, true Python, uh, a Pythonic way, um, it's it's a little restricted. For example, you can't modify object, etc. But you can still do it um, at the at the module level. Like in this case, um, I am changing um, some of the product in some of the module, uh, and just saying that hey, if I do a speak thing, I'm gonna just change it. Um, same thing at Ruby. Um, same thing with JS, although JS had um, historically added this just to make it backwards compatible. Um, and then their prototype libraries for DOMLibs uh, as well as jQuery, they had different emphasis on it, uh, but but that was the general general uh, pattern is that to, in order to add something new, you kind of, you either restrict, do that at the global level, or in this case, uh, what pa Paul Irish provides a pattern for us is to, provide an immediate invoke function expression. And um, these are all good, but we're all going back to a hack of that one fundamental problem, uh, which is we have our program in terms of two things, data and operations. I think as Clojure, Clojure Script engineers, I think we, sh we all hopefully agree with that, right? And at that little, at that center here, uh, if that is the beginning of your problem, we are going in two different directions, I think. Uh, data extensions, operation extensions. How do we do that, right? How do we do that? And I think there are many variants um, that I, it is fair to say that they both could be extensible and that will be nice, right? And that's where we get to the problem called the expression problem. And um, this is, uh, I think, the closest definition I have from the person who's uh, uh, said it, is that it is a new name to an old problem, is to define, the goal is to define a data type by cases, where you can add new cases to the data type and new functions over the data type. It's so, so it's sort of a kind of a two-way thing, not just one way, like in Java uh, interface, you just kind of implement an interface, but you can't do it, you can't do the other way around. Right. Um, so, with that definition in mind, uh, let's let's dig a little deeper. Um, let's look at our let's look at two A and B uh, classes. Um, you now, this is a great example from Stuart Holloway's uh, closure presentation back in 2010. Actually, uh, it still is the best uh, introduction to protocols, I think, uh, in a in a written material. I have the link at the end. Uh, it says we have A and B. Uh, a is the 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 triangles are the the the, uh, the abstract and the squares so are the the implementations. Uh, A should be able to work with B and you know vice versa. In the in the good old Java .NET land of, of the pre dot pre C sharp land, we were not able to move A and B, right? And that's that's kind of essentially the issue there uh, without modifying the original code. So in in a, in a high level, this is the the problem. Um, and uh, let's now dive into protocols uh, in terms of the, its syntax. Um, and I, I, I use examples mostly that are common. Uh, there's only one in my in my reading, there's only one difference between CLJ and CLJS that is uh, reusability. Uh, CLJS uses a specify and closure has a little different syntax, but it's, it's odd enough that it is minor enough that you don't have to worry about it. I think for the most part, uh, the the stuff I'm sharing is is what I've seen at least in libraries and what I've implemented. So let's start with the first thing. We want to create a new protocol and a new type, right? There you go. It's simple enough. Def protocol and a, and a couple def types. Uh, this is the good old basic over polymorphism, right? Uh, you know, based on a type dispatch. I think we all agree. We all understand this. Uh, even uh, I assume that some of you are new to Clojure or Clojure Script. Uh, I hope that this is uh, this is simple enough, um, but this is where things get interesting. Is we can now add new functions over existing types. How do you do that? So let's look at it. So you have def type foo. You now def type, you know, is, let's say an, an incompatible bar, and then you we introduce a protocol, um, which is essentially a way a disciplined way to introduce a, a function. Right, we're saying this is the function signature. We're kind of giving it a sort of a like a like a container for it, if so to speak. And then we're extending foo and extending uh, the incompatible bar with this behavior. Uh, we get it. 
right? This is now getting a little more interesting that we can extend that. We can extend add functions over existing types. And uh, we can also add new protocols to ex existing type, which means we can add a function or a set of functions. Uh, re remember, a protocol essentially is is a container for a function, a set of function signatures. Um, we, for all good purposes, if you're a Java engineer, um, you can think of it as an interface. I mean, that's a good way to start with, though you will see in a bit, uh, it's, it's more, it's beyond that. So we have iFool and we have a def type, they're existing. And now we're introducing a new uh, function and we wanna be able to add that or attach that to foo it again. How do we do that? It's real simple, actually. We just extend type. Now, again, these guys can be somewhere else. They could be defined somewhere else. We just can extend type in our namespace, add that new function. Does that make sense? That's the, that's the best part. And uh, if you invoke that now, if you invoke the uh, foo function on that type, you get the same old guy. But if, in, if you invoke a new function on that same type, hey, you got the new function. So this is where we're extending behavior from the outside. And this is kind of in that realm of what we saw as it's the expression problem is we're kind of going both ways without touching the original. And extend type does that. Uh, this is a, a more fuller example. Um, uh, this guy, uh, David uh, De La Costa had has a nice blog about it. I um, think that's, uh, that's the best um, um, kind of concise explanation of this whole uh, I've seen. Uh, I totally recommend you check it out. And in this example, you can see is a protocol called Sushi and a couple of types called you know, American and Japanese. And then we have a helper function to kind of deal with that. And we'll see in a bit what that means, right? But for now, let's start with a protocol with two functions and two types. And they're both implementing that Sushi uh, protocol. And when we now invoke our helper function, the helper function, again, does not know what types it's getting because we never said what type it is. Do you see that? This is sort of your inversion of control, so to speak, in, in the Java land. And if you can now pass two types to it, but since that function is um, is available in both, right? It it will call the corresponding uh, implementation. Does that make sense? So deal with sushi is taking that. We have no declaration. There are no types in in closure <laughs> or closure script. However, since that function is implemented on both both the types, we can now call them. So that's that's brilliant, I think. Uh, it's it's really nice. It's kind, we're kind of close to OO without the the notion of classes and all the accessories that we get in OO. And I think this is nice. And that's not there, that we're not done yet. There are more things. We can add protocols to a number of types at once. And uh, you can see in this example, you have a couple of def types and um, extend protocol, right, uh, for the for this one, for this type. And then we're adding these two, um, two guys over here. So we're adding more protocols to a number of types at once. This is really useful. And you'll see in the end that I have uh, some practical examples that you can kind of do this wholesale. Clojure script and Clojure do this like left and right. Uh, I'll see the, show you an example, believe it or not. It, all of the sequence functions uh, are implemented um, um, by, by ha latching on to the underlying host with this notion. And uh, uh, one of my favorite uh, libs in CLJS is Ohm. Uh, I've been uh, going back and forth with some experience in Ohm. And uh, yeah, uh, the first uh, production serious lib I saw implementing protocols was David Nolan's Ohm, where uh, there's this notion of reifying an anonymous type. And what that means is essentially that we don't want to save this type. I don't want to like do a def and share it. I just want to have an anonymous thing and it kind of dispose it. So Rayify gives you that. Um, and that's Ray, this is a protocol that it's implementing. And uh, yeah, 
And as you can see now, um, there are many facilities in the language itself that gives you this kind of two-way conversation that I think is missing in languages that did not provide this, that, that we have to resolve to uh, monkey patching, right? And this is the dif difference uh, I mentioned earlier that um, Clojure script has a specify where we can uh, kind of reuse um, the, um, the functions and Clojure has extend. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about it because it is, a, it is probably for the hardcore lib designer. Uh, there are ways to kind of not, I mean, if possible, I, I would avoid this, but there is a way. I just wanted to put that out, that there is a way to reuse um, implementations across. And to sum it up, uh, revisiting our polymorphic dispatch, protocols give you um, protocols and records. Uh, we haven't seen an example, but de de def record is is like a def type with with which also acts like a map. It gives you a nice uh, property based lookup, gives you all the semantics of a map. And we'll see in a bit um, with Stuart Sierra's component model and protocols. Uh, it's it's like a great match. Uh, we can now pass records and attach behavior in a constrained constrained way, there are no classes. It's it's kind of getting best of both worlds. And the best part is uh, they have their own namespace. Each function is its own, its own namespace. And, and you will see that this is how the generic data access is done uh, in Clojure. Um, this is not Java per se, but um, we're really close. Uh, we can have the sequence abstraction and and all the nice things um, using this mechanism. Uh, there are many things, uh, of course, uh, protocols, we can kind of go really deep and spend a whole day. Uh, but I just wanna point out that there are many nice things about uh, having a, a more disciplined approach to monkey patching. Uh, things like I just mentioned, uh, every function in a protocol is namespace. That means now you can't accidentally kind of invoke that function from expecting it that it's going to be in somewhere else, uh, which is the issue with monkey patching. Um, it provides static checks. Um, I have personally seen so much use for this because uh, static uh, being in Clojure, having burnt my fingers with really bad coding <laughs> as well as bugs, um, I've noticed that uh, typos, I've noticed that any good compile error is always a good thing and static checks uh, because protocols are checked. If you call a function with a type that is not confirming to the protocol, you'll get a compile error. I find that as a nice way, kind of a one step forward, uh, instead of having a full you know, type checking. Uh, you can, it is possible to avoid reflection. Uh, if, if, if there is a library out there and I haven't seen one, or maybe there is, uh, I should do a better job of researching it to kind of avoid reflection and do complete dispatch using protocols uh, because um, at the JVM level, that dispatch is the fastest. Uh, rather than reflection, which I think a lot of libs use, uh, and it is not performant. Uh, it is good for decoupling from the context. Um, all of these examples, uh, hopefully we'll see in a bit. And gives you a principal interface uh, for plugging in hooks for instrumentation. Uh, what I mean um, is that it gives you a sense of like adding in a central location, uh, sort of like uh, you can think of AOP, uh, poor man's AOP, I would say, to, to have a way to manage that. Uh, uh, again, we'll see. Um, I work with Dave at Level, um, and uh, is is fast. Is a great guy. Um, has a, a really good understanding of a lot of things, and I sort of agree with this um, um, notion that they're elegant um, a way of handling uh, the monkey patching issue. But I can hear some of you say that, hey, I'm a functional programmer. Why are you like telling me, oh, oh listen, I'm a oh, oh guy as well. Uh, I, I'm, I don't practice uh, anymore, uh, but I, I have, uh, I'm fond of what I've learned. And I think using ideas um, from our past um, is not a bad thing. And uh, what's more is that we can start integrating. When you have ideas like these and you start looking around, you can start integrating with other ideas. And one of my favorite libs that I've come out in the Clojure community is Stuart Sierra's component. I've implemented three big features, in fact, in our code base with that. And we're going component actually now, uh, full scale if possible. We can't refactor our whole code, but but we possible we're gonna move because there is a sense of structure coming from here, 
uh, which is inevitable, not because someone is bad closure engineer, it's just the nature of production code is that we add new members, we move fast, we break things, and we need sense of structure in both schema and records and component in, in conjunction with protocols provide that structure. And I think no matter what language you use, um, in my experience, uh, I've been coding for like, you know, 14 years now, uh, there's always this urge to have a structure, a discipline, uh, whether you're from static or dynamic worlds. And um, as I said, uh, I did want to focus on the third part. Um, I hope the introduction for expression problem, the monkey patching and the polymorphic fast dispatch uh, was uh, helpful. Uh, but this is my favorite because, you know, coming from the OHO land, uh, we have a lot of patterns which we kind of, you know, uh, threw, threw out now. Uh, I'm not a big fan of those anymore. But but there, there, there could be more patterns in the functional land. Uh, why not, right? Uh, uh, we always see re repetition. And both in the back end and the UI, uh, I work across the stack. Um, there, I see a, a rep sense of repetition. And uh, I think protocols could give you that. Of course, ma macros are the ultimate, but you know that's, that's not for the faint of heart. And it is still um, a leap different. Uh, but I think in protocols, we can see some patterns. And let's look at a few what I found. Uh, this is. Uh, no empirical data or anything. This is just my experience. Um, is that the first thing it provides uh, is that it gives you a non monolithic organic growth, a sense of like, it gives you a way to like stop the, the breaking of the chain. You, so, you know what I mean? Like, um, actually, show, let me show you the code. Makes sense. So, what I mean by that is, let's uh, show you a simple example. So, so this is um, closure script code, uh, just a sample. And an R seek uh, is a def type, um, which implements def different uh, protocols, um, object being one of them, clonable, meta, uh, seekable is a protocol. Next, does that ring a bell? And a way that this is... Uh, uh, sorry to interrupt you there. Uh, some people are just asking if you can increase the font size. Got it. Hey, is that helpful? So, so this is a protocol. RSeq is a def type with several protocol. And the nice thing about this is this little guy over here, which says E6 iterable, R seek. What does that mean? Let's look at it. Um, bump the size. <laughs> I'm going to keep doing this. Uh, so no, it's going to. Hopefully, I'll walk you through this and raise your hand if you can't. So E6, in fact, is a def type. E6 iterator is an is a protocol in the uh, new spec. Uh, in fact, it is not a, a contract based protocol as in closure closure script, but in the generic notion of a protocol. And this is the way David uh, wrote it, um, is that he uh, is a def type. It implements the object protocol and has a next. Beautiful, right? And then now there's a function called E6 iterator. Now it returns an ES205 compatible iterator for a collection. Now I don't expect you to read every single line of this. And obviously we're, we're kind of skimming through this, but but walk me with this. I, I hope you can walk me with this, that when I jump sort of transition to this, what I'm trying to show you is that we have an E6 def type, a function iterator, and now we have a def type iterator sequence, which is now iSeekable and iSeek, iSeek, implementing these two protocols. We're kind of slowly unwrapping everything into the closure script land, right? We're making that an iSeek, which is again a closure implementation that was ported to closure script. And the final boom is this, um, is that E6 iterator sequence gives you an, an ES6 iterator sequence. And believe it or not, this one we saw earlier is for almost every type. I can't, I, I can't guarantee, but I the last I checked, every in, uh, seek type of CLJS is now wrapped in an ES6 iterable because 
an ES6 iterator is implementing ES6 iterator def type. Does that, does that make sense, guys? I mean, we're somehow kind of totally map, mapping those two ADMs into one, kind of making that bridge happen. And I think this is great. Um, and, and, and the reason I say it's non-monolithic organic growth is because if you look at Clojure script source code and Clojure, all these have grown apart. ES5 is fairly new. When Clojure script came in 2012, ES, uh, ES6 was not even close to being complete. So this is a kind of an organic growth. So how do you make, how do you create an organic growth without being monolithic? And I think one way with protocols is by extending types, by type extensions and protocol extensions. My other favorite example is uh, logical abstractions, uh, bringing, two, uh, bringing two different abstractions and interoperating uh, them together. Um, I think the one we just said kind of falls in the same space, but um, let's uh, look at something a bit more nicer. Um, symbols. If you remember symbols, Closure script and Lisp uh, have closure have symbols. The symbol is a def type. Again, implements these two guys, uh, object and i equal, and it's a function. Now, symbol is a function. When I first read about this, like I think I first tried to re read closure three and a half years ago, and I had no freaking idea what a symbol was, right? And you know, having done five production code uh, in closure, I kind of like I can't live without it. Uh, because everything is kind of built around that idea, right? So symbol is a function. This is how it is. Like, how do you bring two complete different ideas and re-implement them? And you see symbol is implementing a lot. And there is a def, def n symbol. This is a function symbol that if you can, I'm going to quickly scan, hopefully. It, what it's saying is that it, it can take a name or a namespace, and it gives you the symbol object. Do you see this, guys? It is, in fact, creating the type. So one pattern I noticed is kind of define the def type over there, have protocol, implement, it, implement the existing protocols to kind of bind those two, and then define a function so you could use that function with the rest of the code. So this is something I've kind of noticed. You could, you know, you're, you're, I urge you to look at the closure script and closure source code to see how this functions out. And my third example, um, we have 10 minutes. So let's look at my, th the third one I saw is uh, the conformance in a dynamic world. Um, obviously, if you're a fan of dynamic languages, which I presume most of you are, otherwise we will be in um, Scala.js conference by now, right? Um, that there is, there is something beautiful about the dynamic nature of Lisp and FP and closure, closure script in general. But I don't think that is hunky dory. You know, there are too many errors, too many typos, too many hands changing, and too many requirements changing and breaking fast. We know the story. We know what it means to ship something we don't like, but we have to. So where do we get the conformance? Uh, I'll show you one example I've implemented recently. Um, it's, uh, uh, in fact, uh, I just got a note from Alex that my talk was accepted at Closure West. So this is actually how it looks. Uh, I'm going to do a whole talk on this in a few months in Seattle. It's about a caching layer. And the story is about how uh, we implemented a caching layer at level uh, uh, capital one. Um, when our existing code base was uh, implementing a cache in DynamoDB, don't judge. That's how things work. Uh, we got to move fast and build fast, right? So the first team built um, entire cache in Dynamo because that was the uh, database. And you know, when I first came in, one of my first tasks was to kind of move away uh, both into a, a more solid um, cache across the system and use a memcache. So one of my first things was to not break code, but kind of decouple the existing code because there were so many services calling the cache directly. So I had to introduce a protocol uh, and do um, a, and do decouple those things and kind of introduce lifecycle and a lot of uh, introspection in between that. And what I mean by that is uh, if you look at this protocol, which I think is, is fairly readable, you know, query, get, 
and update and validate. And this is Stuart Sierra's component. I think um, if you're new to that, uh, component uh, is a pattern that has a start oh, and a sorry. stop. Sorry, uh, we have some people asking if the font can be made a little bit bigger still. So. All right, there you go, thanks. Um, a component pattern, a quick overview, is simply a, a protocol with two methods, start and stop, right? And uh, what you see here is interesting because now I've defined a record called cache and implemented towards Sierra's component. I'm starting connecting all of that resources. This is going into a Docker instance, et cetera, et cetera, kind of checking all the stuff, and I'm stopping as well. And I'm also implementing my own cache and then implementing all the the kind of uh, management stuff that you need to do around before you do the actual cache stuff. And the, and the reason and the story for this is that this gives you a central location for managing. I'm going to bump the font down a little bit so that it's not wrapping down. But if you see the structure here, right, it gives you a sense of what I mean by uh, Conformance in a dynamic world, I think. It's the fact that I need to confirm, oops, <laughs> I need to confirm my cache uh, logic when there are 50 services using that and I don't have to break that while there is production code being shipped, while I am confirming to a spec that is not complete and I have five weeks to implement that. And we are still adding cache. In fact, this is an ongoing thing and we add new caches all the time. And I found that in, in conjunction with Stuart Sierra's protocol uh, component model and the protocol, and, and obviously using your own judgment to decouple your ongoing problem with uh, the, the implementation, uh, it gives you a nice space. It gives you a nice space in a fast moving breaking code. It get, kind of gives you a check mark. And you can see all my check marks here. In fact, I do all kinds of like, you know, we put all, all kinds of metrics in the component and the real logic, if you see the real logic is actually here, core get is the real logic. But I do all of this stuff, all of this management stuff in the component because that stuff is constantly changing. The, this logic never changes. It's literally a three lines of code to memcache, right? That's what I mean by adding things around uh, before things break. Um and to interrupt, but we're running a little bit tight on time. Did you want to answer some questions soon? Um, let's see, five minutes. Sure. Uh, I will open. So let me wrap it up. Wrap it up in a couple minutes, and I will uh, open up for maybe a, one question if I have time. One or two questions. And so the other two, I'll keep the slides open. And uh, the the two other things I liked um, about the protocol is um, that it does help you decouple from the context as well as a, a sense of require, gives you a sense of a uh, set of requirements for modeling behavior. Um, fortunately, we're running out of time, but there's a beautiful example I wanted to show, uh, but the, the slides are up uh, if you wanna see it uh, later on. Um, and it is essentially an entire implementation of a transaction with schema, uh, using schema as well as uh, protocols. We are going to skip that. <laughs> and in my last, I do want to leave this note when I open the question is that since we're seeing some patterns, some large component uh, and some of the patterns I've noticed, and I'm sure the community has a lot uh, to offer. Um, I urge all of us, um, because I asked this question myself, is that there are many ways to combine ideas. In fact, this is the opening section in uh, SICP book. Uh, and I love this is that when we combine ideas or when we look at them from distance, uh, great things happen. And I want to end with this note because I think it's not OO versus FP, it's not monkey patching versus expression. And the bigger question is like, it's okay to use ideas, right? It's okay that we can work together and combine ideas. And I think protocols is an awesome thing. Uh, schema component is even better and there are def many libs using that. So that's it. Um, I hope it was useful. I hope some of you are excited. If you're an OO fan, skeptic about FP, don't worry, Clojure has some idioms, if not all. So if we have one question, I would love to answer. If not, I'm happy to be on the chat and answer any other questions. Uh, thank you. Um, if you scroll down a little bit, you will see that we have a few questions. Um, 
if you look up Pritchum on the mm -hmm. uh, Crowdcast page. Whoops, lost your feed there. Um, if you want to do one or two of those, you can always comment afterwards to answer them if you like. Uh, let's see. Am I l looking at the right? This is the last talk now. Um, um, there's a tab that says questions and topics just below the feed. Oh, my bad, guys. Oh, okay. This is a new one. So let's see. Oh, these are all excellent questions. I think it might take more than a minute to answer, but I would say that we have a uh, we have a few minutes. If you want to read them out and answer them, I'll. I'll let sure. Sure. Um. Let's see. So here's the question. In ex, uh, the question says, in extending component lifecycle protocols to your domain entities, wouldn't it make sense to do it elsewhere than in the core logic namespace? Uh, on the other hand, you end up splitting logic, any rule of thumb on deciding between the two. Thanks. Um, if I understand this right, uh, it looks like the question is around where to have your logic uh, in conjunction with lifecycle protocols. Um, I think it's. it seems to me like it's a matter of taste as well as if you want to constrain that logic, a uh, couple that logic in with the life cycle. Uh, in my implementations, the three times I have actually uh, used that in the same namespace because I see that life cycle uh, as well as the, the hooks around the life cycle if you want to think about it uh, because components give you that mechanism, at least a starting point. Uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's a nice place to start right there in that namespace. Uh, you've seen that in the example of cache. There was the other example you can see in the slides later. I've used it both. We've used it both in the same namespace. Uh, using it in another namespace is great if you you know have that example of uh, ex implementing the protocol and the component or, or the, the type is another namespace. Uh, I, I hope that answers that question. Um, the other question, that was a quick question, so I'll just answer that. Are def timer and def meter your own construct? Yes, there are simple um, macros uh, that are wrapping um, the metrics Java lib, um, which which is I think a great metrics library. So we just put that all the metrics logging events. There's like a whole bunch of things. That was actually a stripped down example, but there's a whole bunch of things that goes when you're connecting it to an external resource that you must manage in production setup. So I think I found component to be a great place to shove in all of that before you do the actual logic, sort of your AO, poor man's AOP. Um, the last question um, uh, would be uh, this one by Sharvit, uh, please address please address the possibility to combine the inheritance paradigm with protocols. Uh, so I, I believe I didn't use the word inheritance directly, but but the notion of extending um, uh, having a def type and implementing the def type with several protocols is uh, the the inheritance, right? Uh, when you have a type that is extending protocols, we are inheriting that behavior. Um, and then uh, you can do that with any type, with an existing behavior or an add new behavior. So it is a way of having a strict single inheritance model as well as multiple, if, if you want to use that word, uh, but it is not the, the kind of multiple inheritance that, that we know of from the C++. Um, uh, I, I hope that gives uh, some, some answer. Um, if you have time, there's a, I see there's one question there that has five votes from Drew. You have Ooh, time to answer yes. that. Yeah. Could you clarify avoid reflection why that's good? It might be to set a start. Def okay. Um, so this is, um, this is something uh, my um, uh, Dave had mentioned me as well. Um, I think he has a good blog on it. Uh, a lot of Java libs uh, and as well as closure libs use reflection to kind of read the objects uh methods uh, at runtime and knowing out the meta nature of an object class etc runtime is is slow right i think we all know that in some sense that reflection any code with reflection is, is a tad bit slower than doing that compile time uh, that's why the static guys have have always had that case and like they win in that right like they do that at compile time um, and with protocols uh, since 
if, if there is a way to do that in protocols that we can avoid reflection if you want to do a meta lookup on your object, on your function. And we've seen in the examples, um, if it's not, I guess if it's not clear, I, I think I want to make an effort of doing that after the talk is that with you can have def types and def records and you can have protocols and then the, the way they, they confirm to something gives you that lookup, that meta lookup that you're asking, this, does this object, does this record have this function? We're doing that at compile time. And I think that's what I meant by saying we can avoid reflection in, in at least some strong cases, um, like domain cases. Um, I haven't seen a library. Um, uh, I think if I find one great example, I would want to post it. Um, but, but I think that's what I meant. I uh, hope that makes sense. Cool. So I think that'll do it for our session here. Thank okay. you so much for coming and talking and answering a few questions. Mm -hmm. Alrighty, uh, you're welcome to stay and um, chat with people in the chat on the side there if you like. Uh, you can comment to answer other questions if you feel like mm -hmm. you can answer some of those. Other than that, thank you very sure. much. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, guys. Bye.